Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your, for your mercy and your grace, for your faithfulness that sustains us, Lord. We thank you that your mercy that are new every morning. We honor you today. We honor you in this place. We worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Right, uh, so we've been uh, learning about the presence of God the last two classes, uh, the importance of His presence, uh, what we, um, the origins of it, how we were separated in the Garden of Eden because of this, because of sin, and what Jesus has done for us uh, on the cross to um, give us complete access to His presence. Right. So we've learned quite a bit about that. We've learned about Moses, the tabernacle of Moses, a little bit about David um, and how he pursued the presence of God. Uh, we've combined chapter 7 and chapter 8. If, you're, okay, if you've forgotten, we're making those chapter 7 and chapter 8 as one big chapter right? about the presence of God. We learned that God is omnipresent. Omnipresent means he's not just geographically present everywhere. He's in our past, present, and in our future because he is outside of time, right? Um, so we learned a little bit about that. Uh, so let's continue learning uh, from that similar chapter, from the same chapter. Um, wait, which, uh, in your notes. Look at the section where Jesus Christ is a perfect sacrifice from chapter eight. Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. Okay, so in the tabernacle of Moses, we learned that there are, there is the outer courts, the inner courts, and the what's the final section in the tabernacle of Moses? Holy of Holies, yeah, the most holy place, also known, right? Right. So there's the outer courts um, where there can be hundreds of people, and the inner courts or the holy place will will have only just a few, ten or twelve space for that, right? So you can praise God in a crowd. You can serve him with a group of people, right? But you can only worship him face to face, right? So we learned that. And but in the new covenant, we look at a few scriptures and see how God has made a way for us. Okay, Hebrews chapter nine. I'm just reading all the scriptures from your notes. Okay, it's in your notes already. Hebrews chapter nine, verse nine, and verse eleven and twelve. Uh, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of his creation not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the holy of holies once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Okay, look at that verse 11. It starts off by saying, but Christ came as, as high priest. Okay, and then you come down to verse 12. It says, not with blood of goats or calves, but with his own blood. So once again, last class, we learned that Jesus is not only our sacrifice, he is also our high priest. He is not just our offering, he is also the offerer. Yeah, okay. So he's a perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. Um, and with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Eternal. There's no more sacrifice that is needed for us to make way into the Holy of Holies. Jesus has made a way once and for all. Are you with me? Right. Okay, let's read some more scriptures. Hebrews 10, 11, 12. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. 
Wait, what did we learn until Jesus came? Everything that was done until Jesus came was it was a covering. Isn't it? It was a sacrifice that would cover the sins. Yes? Let's just think about it for a minute, okay? Now, you know in the tabernacle of Moses, there was something called the Ark of the Covenant? Yes? Okay, so what was inside the Ark? Ark of the Covenant is just like a big box. The inside the Ark of the Covenant, there was the tablets, that's the ten tablets means not dolo. <laughs> okay, what the Ten Commandments, right? That was written. It was inside that. And what else was inside that? No, no. So good. In, I'm talking inside the Ark of the Covenant. Sorry, you were saying something, Gertrude? Uh, yeah. It's a rod of uh, uh, Aaron. Okay, Aaron's staff. Yeah. Right. And what else? A pot of manna. Bread. So, there were three things inside the Ark of the Covenant that was kept. What was that? The commandments, the tablets of commandments, the rod of Aaron, and manna, bread, okay, a pot of bread. Now, why were those inside the Ark of the Covenant? Now, the root meaning for Ark, I'm getting a little sidetracked and being tempted to go a little deep, but I don't want to. <laughs> Because uh, it'll be like I'm going down a rabbit hole. But basically, all of these three things symbolize something. Ten commandments. The first commandment, Israel's broke. What is the first commandment? Love what is the first God. commandment? Love your God with all your heart. So no, thou shalt have no other gods before you. That's the first commandment. Okay. So what did they do? They broke that first commandment by making an idol, right? So they broke that. They sinned. So why is Aaron's staff inside? When Moses, when God said, okay, Aaron shall be the leader, the people of Israel or some of the leaders of Israel said, why should we follow you? Why should you be our leader? So in that when they did that, they were rejecting God's leadership. Are you with me? They were rejecting God's leadership. They, were, they sinned by disobeying or questioning. Are you with me? And then why is manna inside the ark? Is they again despised the provision of the Lord. They grumbled, they murmured, they were not thankful about what God provided for them. Are you with me? So all of these supernatural things that what God was doing, people of Israel rejected. And so God tells Moses, put all of that inside that. And, and then cover it with a layer of the mercy seat. So on top of the, inside the Ark of the Covenant, all of these three things were there. And then there was like a plain sheet like this. And then there were two cherubims, isn't it? One cherubim was facing the other, the other cherubim on this side, isn't it? And with the wings held up high, they were looking down. Okay, so the cherubims are the archangels in a, in a certain way, right? Um, they were almost like the eyes of God. Okay, so that means every time they were looking down, they were reminded of the sins of, peop of people. Are you with me? Every time they were looking down, they were reminded, they, dis they rejected me as their leader or their shepherd. They had another God instead of me. They rejected, uh, they were not grateful for my provision. So, in God's eyes, he's always looking at the sin of Israel. Are you with me? So once a year, on the day of atonement, the high priest would go inside and put the blood of a goat or calves on the mercy seat. Yes, and so now that is like a covering of the sin that would buy them mercy for another year. Are you with me? So that, that was just a covering of the sin until Jesus came where John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who 
takes away. So there was no more covering required because Jesus took it all away. Are you with me? Yeah. So uh, that's what's being uh, presented here in the Hebrews as well. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And so because of what Jesus did, you and me, you and I have unlimited access. Say unlimited. Yeah. yeah. Have you gone to an unlimited buffet? Very happy, no? Unlimited buffet means, like, oh, bindas. It, it, <laughs> limitless. What is a bottomless? Something like that is there, no? <laughs> you can drink how much ever you want. But because of what Jesus has done, right? Because of the sacrifice, because of what he did for us, for you and for me, you and I have unlimited access to his presence. Unlimited access to the presence of God. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. But that is not enough. Most of us as Christians, we are very happy to be the outer court Christians. Like, yes, I met Jesus as my savior at the cross. That is enough for me. I'm more than happy. I'm more very happy in the outer courts. The fresh air is there. I don't want to go all the way to the Holy of Holies. It's too much trouble. We are very satisfied in the outer courts. We don't want to go all the way to the Holy of Holies, where Jesus has made a way. The veil has been torn. You with me? Right? Okay, let's read some more scriptures. Uh, Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of... By the blood of what? Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Right. So what we are encouraged, and what I want to encourage us this morning is, just like how the high priest would draw near to the presence of God or to the Holy of Holies, let us draw near. High priest only entered once a year. And, you know, the ancient culture of Jews, Hebrews says that the high priest would have a bell and a, a rope a, tied to his leg. That if the high priest that went entered in was sinful, <laughs> in the presence of God, he would die. And so other people can't go in and to bring him out. So that rope was there to pull him out. Do you understand how dangerous that is? I don't seem, don't think you all understand what was happening. Okay, it was quite, <laughs> yeah. So the high priest had to be, uh, had to have lived a holy life, a consecrated life. In the new covenant, Bible calls you and me as a royal priesthood. Are you with me? But yet there is a grace and mercy. There's an invitation. It says, boldly come. Come boldly. Because of the blood of Jesus. Yes? So I want to share some of the tips uh, maybe, or guidelines maybe on uh, how we can enter his presence or personally worship him. Okay? So first thing is draw near to God intentionally. According to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. It says, draw near. Draw near. That means come closer. That's what draw near is. Okay? Come closer. 
So how do we come closer or how do we go closer to God? First one, with a true heart, in sincerity and wholeheartedly. With a, everybody say true heart. Yeah. So if you seek me with all your heart, you will? You will not find me. Yes, very true. <laughs> okay. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Yeah. So we draw near to God intentionally with a true heart, in faith, with clear conscience. Ask God for forgiveness and repent with a clear conscience, with a pure heart and with boldness. So we can't enter his presence with sin in our hearts, with unrepented sin. We can't enter his presence with bitterness in our hearts. Are you following, right? I can't, I can't be up, uh, you know, bitter against an individual and then uh, come in to his presence. We come in with clear conscience. We ask God to sanctify us and wash us and make us and make us pure through His Word. You know, God's Word has different images in the Bible. Jeremiah says God's Word is like a hammer. Do you know that? Okay, Jeremiah says God's Word is like a hammer and James refers to God's word as a mirror right where you look at a mirror and you will not walk back the same you will do some adjustments isn't it so God's word is like a mirror that reflects and tells you what's wrong and correct yourself and God's word also says is like a river or water that purifies us are you with me right Joshua chapter 3 verse 5 you don't have to turn, but okay. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5 says, Consecrate yourself today, so tomorrow God will work among you. Is that what it says? I hope it's okay. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Consecrate yourself, so tomorrow God will do wonders among you. So, if we consecrate ourselves today, we go before Him and ask Him to wash us in His Word, wash us with, his, uh, with, with the power of the Holy Ghost, then we are being ready, we are being prepared for God to do something in us and through us. Yes? Okay, so we draw near to God intentionally with a true heart. Um, we draw near to Him in faith, with clear conscience, with pure water, Washed with pure water, that's the word of God, and boldness. The second guideline for personal worship is express thanksgiving and praise in spoken words in song. Express thanksgiving and in praise. Um, in the last class, we learned that words attract presence. Isn't it? Words attract presence. It could either attract the presence of God or the presence of the devil. Words of thanksgiving and praise attract the presence of God. Words of complaining and murmuring and not being grateful attract the presence of the devil, right? Why do we say that? Because if God is enthroned on our praises, who is enthroned on our complaints? Ah, yeah. If we enter God's gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, whose gates are we entering when we complain and murmur and being un when we're not grateful? Devil, yeah, there we go. Okay, so express thanksgiving, uh, right? That's how we draw near to Him. Um, worship with the Word. Worship with the Word. Okay, um, so that means simply open up your Bible and start singing. If you can sing or not sing, that is irrelevant. Open up your Bible. Bible says, you know, he's put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. So just do that. Okay. Uh, Cyril is there to help. Cyril, why don't you, uh, can you play the pads in E major? Yeah, let's say um, I don't have an instrument, so I'm going to use pads as an instrument. Um, so I'm just going to randomly, I'm just going to turn to Psalm 27. Okay. Oh, sure. 
Okay, I'm just using that as an instrument because I don't have a guitar. So worship God with the word. Um, that means simply open up your Bible and just start singing. Um, are you? Can they hear the pads online? Okay. So um, something as a reference just to be on pitch. So I've just opened Psalm 27, um, and I'll just start singing. I'll try and sing only from verse 1, maybe verse 4, I don't know. So. You can turn to Psalm 27 just for your reference. So it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? OK, let's worship. Let's see. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Oh God, you shine, you're my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. The Lord is the light of my life. There is no shadow of turning in you. There is no shadow of turning in you. You shine like the sun. You shine like the sun. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? One thing I seek of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord for all the days of my life. I one thing I seek of the Lord that I may behold His beauty, His glory, His wonder, that I may gain upon the beauty of the Lord. And whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? Okay, so that's just an example of how you can simply open up your Bible and sing and worship. Okay, thanks, Cyril. Okay, um, I love poetry, I, rhyming words. I love poetry, but God's word can do what poetry cannot. 
right? His word can do what poetry cannot. So if we simply open up our Bibles and just begin to sing and worship, we just sang one verse, right? The Lord is the light of my life and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid of? And as you're singing, um, you begin to get other revelations of what light can do, right? He shines like the, you know, like the sun. You know, revelations one says, his face was shining like the sun in all its brilliance. That's what it says, right? Um, and uh, what it says, the Bible says that in his presence, there is no shadow of turning. Heaven needs no sun because his, the light of his face lights up all of heaven. You think heaven has a sun? Why does it need a sun? The glory of his presence is enough to light up all of heaven. Right? So as you begin to sing, the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal the different aspects of just, we were just saying one verse, light. That's the first thing he said, let there be light. Are you with me? So something powerful happens if you just open up your Bible, any language, and you just begin to sing. And you just say, okay, Holy Spirit, what does this passage sound like to you? How does this sound to you? Ask him. And just start singing. Are you with me? Right. So this is one of the ways in how you can uh, draw yourself closer to God, worship with God, worship with the word and praying and singing in tongues. It's connected to the previous point. Okay, praying and singing in tongues. Um, uh, again, I would encourage you to do one of the best investments I made is 10 rupees. Uh, go to OM Books or you know, ELS, buy a thousand praises book. Okay, it's, I'm sure it's available in Hindi as well. Um, it's there, right? Yeah. So I think it's 10 rupees. Maybe it's become 20 rupees now. 10. It's still 10? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You can get it for free on, in, on the internet as well. Um, soak in it, right? Let those praises be in your heart. Be ready to praise. You know, when trouble comes, you might not have the Bible with you or the books with you. Let your heart be a library of books. Understanding? Let your heart be a library of books so that your, your spirit can tap in to that and say, it's ready to erupt in praise. Are you with me? All right. So those are the simple guidelines for personal worship. Draw near to God intentionally. Uh, intentional means you have to plan. OK, you have to be intentional. Make up your mind and uh, express thanksgiving and praise. Uh, worship with the word. Pray and sing in tongues. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of secret of how I, I, if I'm spending time, if I have one hour, this is just an example. Uh, one hour has how many minutes? 60 minutes. So I will divide that into three sections, 20, 20, 20. Uh, for the first 20 minutes, I will read the word. Second 20 minutes, I will uh, just worship. I will worship either I, I will either listen to a worship music or I will worship by myself uh, listen to songs um, or sing and then the last 20 minutes pray um, pray either pray in tongues is get more intentional pray in tongues uh, Prayer requests, right? Prayer requests, um, yeah. So I would divide my personal time into these three things. If it is two hours, uh, everything will just become double, right? Yeah, 20 minutes will become 40 minutes, 40 minutes of word, 40 minutes of worship, 40 minutes of praying, praying in tongues. Um, this is a very simple thing. This is a short glimpse into how um, I approach one hour.
Okay. Uh, very quickly, we look at what happens when we worship. Again, these are points that we've already gone through. Um, when we worship, when we personally praise God, God is enthroned on our praises, right? Um, praise causes divine deliverance. Uh, you're looking at your notes, right? It's there in your notes. Okay. God inhabits the praises of his people. Praise causes divine deliverance. Praise stops the enemy. And finally, praise prepares our heart to receive from God. Praise prepares our heart to receive from God. Hosea chapter 10 verse 11, it simply says, Judah shall plow. Judah shall plow. Plowing is what? It's related with farming. Right? You plow the field, isn't it? You, you make it ready. And then you put the seeds and you wait for the rain. So it says, Judah shall plow. It means with praise, you prepare your heart. Judah means praise. right? When you prepare your heart with praise, you are making yourself ready to receive from God. Are you with me? Um, you know, when I was leading, when I was the youth pastor for four years, um, one of the things what... Um, young people come to me and said a lot was, uh, <laughs> how do I hear God? How do I hear God? Or, you know, uh, how do I know this is the will of God in my life? Yeah. Um, Pastor, I read the Bible, but I don't understand anything. Pastor, I, uh, you know, I, I read the Bible, but I don't understand anything. And then I don't remember anything. This is the constant thing, uh, you know, I used to hear from my young people. Um, okay, how many of you here remember what you had for breakfast two weeks ago on Monday? Two weeks ago, not two days ago. Do you remember two, last, say, two weeks ago, Tuesday, anybody else? Monday, no? Okay, so Tuesday. Oh, so you have a set schedule. <laughs> right. But usually, if you didn't have a schedule, maybe some of them must not remember with, even with the schedule, but I don't remember what I had for breakfast two weeks ago on a Tuesday morning. But it still satisfied me. It kept me alive. Yes or no? Yeah, you might not remember what you ate two weeks ago, but you still it kept you alive, isn't it? It still satisfied your hunger. Yeah? Okay. How many of you love biryani? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I love biryani. But I don't understand biryani. You, there's a difference, no? I love biryani. I don't understand everything that goes into it. I like okay. There's like if you're especially if you're in India, there's like ten different ways on how you can make biryani. Ambur biryani, Dindical biryani, Kerala biryani. I don't. Uh, it's not really biryani, but okay. <laughs> it's a very controversial statement I just made there. <laughs> I'm going to be in very deep trouble. Um, <laughs> but okay, my point is. I, I love biryani and I eat it. I don't necessarily understand it, but it still quenches my hunger. It satisfies my hunger, isn't it? So it's the same thing with the word of God, is that you don't need to remember it. It's, if you remember it, amazing, right? But don't, don't use the excuse of remembering or understanding to not read it at all. So most of the young people, they say, because I can't understand it, I'm not going to read it. Because I can't remember it, I'm not going to read the Bible. Are you with me? And so that is creating a space to not receive anything from the Word of God. Bible says faith comes from hearing. And here's the thing. A lot of us make a mistake of by reading that very differently. We're saying faith comes from hearing, hear, of hearing the Word of God. No. 
faith comes from hearing comma hearing comes from the word of god so the more you read you train yourself how to hear from god are you with me the more you read his word he is the word you train yourself how to hear him isn't it and so uh, all of that happens in worship everything what we just spoke about <laughs> happens in worship are you with me so everything what we've just spoken about happens in personal worship um, let's speak a little bit about congregational worship uh, combined worship congregational worship okay <clears throat> Congregational worship, or is the first point there, is the vertical aspect of it. We come together to minister to God. Okay, minister to? We minister to God, okay. We worship to better realize the presence of God and the main difference between a church and a ser church service and a meeting of a social organization is the presence of God. Um, okay, I don't know how many of us, I don't know if this is even going to work, but uh, let me risk it. Um, okay, this group, this guys, can you make a sound? Um, Cyril, can you play a C major? Sorry, Cyril. You can all sing. No, I want you to just hum a note. Okay? Can you hum a note? Yes? No? Okay. Let's play C major, Cyril. Let's try that out. I hope you're not too shy to just hum a note. Okay. <laughs> okay. This side. Hmm. Hmm. Hum. Little loudly. Mm, little loudly. OK, this side, you, Joseph, and you. Mm, mm, mm. Come on, come on, go on, Dan. Little louder. Mm, mm. Keep humming, don't stop. Mm, mm. Keep humming, keep humming. <laughs> okay, thank you. So that was just that was just an example of a C major chord. So you were singing a different note. You were singing the note C. You were singing a uh, humming the note E, and I was humming the note G. So it's these three notes, three different notes or pitches come together to make one chord. That's a C major chord. But you see, we were singing different pitches or different notes, but we still sounded as one. Isn't it? And that's what a choir does, is choir has uh, sopranos, altos, tenors, bass. right? They are singing different notes, a different harmony, but they still sound as? as one, isn't it? And that's the significance of uh, corporate worship or congregational worship is we are all different individuals, different people from different backgrounds, people from different states. Yes, but we still come together. We are gathered together in the name of Jesus. And so when we come together in his name from all these different backgrounds and worship uh, corporately, that becomes very powerful. Are you with me? Right? This, the unity in worship is very powerful. Uh, you know, we read in the Old Testament time and time that it says when they worshipped in one accord, when they worshipped in unity, when they lifted up their voice in, in, as in one voice, God showed up. His glory would come down as a cloud and fill the temple. Are you with me? Right? And so... Um, in corporate worship, we minister to God. That's the vertical aspect of it. 
And when we come together in unity, that is the horizontal aspect, you know, is that we bless one another. Ephesians chapter 5 says, sing to one another. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, 19, and 20 onwards, when you read it, it says, uh, don't be filled with don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the spirit and sing to one another in psalms hymns and spiritual songs so that's what happens in corporate worship is we are yes ministering to god first but at the same time we are encouraging one another we are singing to one another right we are building we are edifying one another we are you with me Right? Psalm 133 Psalm 133 says how wonderful how beautiful it is when men come together in unity. It is like uh, an oil that flows down Aaron's head, down his beard, all the way down his cloak. Okay? Um, so, as in, I'll, probably I'll stop here. Uh, as a summary, as a conclusion of this chapter, we look, let's look at that summary. In congregational worship, we minister to God. In corporate worship, it brings about a sense of unity within the church. The songs we sing as congregation enable us to learn, teach, and reinforce spiritual truth. Corporate worship prepares our hearts and provides the atmosphere for the preaching of the Word of God. It facilitates us to express the feelings of our heart in uninhibited worship. Okay, so we've spoken about the presence of God. We've spoken about uh, the personal worship and corporate worship and the power of it. All right? Well, that's about it for today, then. I'll uh, stop here. Thank you for joining. Uh, Vicky, I see your questions. I'll answer it uh, in the chat section. All right? Thank you. God bless you guys.